Today, we'll meet Dr. Edla Sanchez, who runs the top natural toxins research lab in the nation at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. She'll take us back to Falfurrias High School, where she first discovered her love of science, and she'll show us some of the deadly snakes she works with every day. We'll also visit the planetarium at Texas A&M University Commerce, where we'll meet a freshly minted PhD who discovered her love of astronomy there as an undergraduate. All that and more on this episode of Around Texas. Everything is bigger in Texas. The Texas A&M University system is no exception. Bigger plans, bigger ideas. We strive to make a bigger difference across the Lone Star State and around the world. 11 universities, eight state agencies, one mission, working every day to build a brighter tomorrow. Meet the people striving to make a Texas-sized difference every day across the A&M system. Welcome to Around Texas with Chancellor John Sharp. Elder Sanchez learned she loved science at Falfurious High School. And at Texas A&M University in Kingsville, she learned she loved snakes. Dr. Sanchez now runs the nation's top snake venom research lab, saving lives and advancing science. We'll meet her and her snakes next. I grew up in Falfurrias, Texas. Uh, it has about 5,000 people. You know, it's just your typical small town, one supermarket, your Whataburger that every Texas town should have, uh, and just one theater that probably no, that no longer exists anymore. But that was about it, it's a, it's a small town. You know everybody, and so, you know, this was a perfect place, you know, to come to high school. I was encouraged as a young girl to study science. I had a really great uh, science teacher, and her name was uh, Monica Muchetti. She taught the biology classes. Uh, there was always some project that she, was, she had us working on. She would take us out uh, on field trips to survey you know, the land and use various instruments to, in order for us to do that. And that's basically one of the best experiences that I've had as far as classes when I was in high school. I am Elda Sanchez. I am the director and associate professor of the National Natural Toxins Research Center at Texas A&M Keensville. I didn't grow up loving snakes. Uh, I started appreciating them and loving them when I started working at the Venom Lab back in the 90s. Working with Elda, she's a, a great mentor. She's a great leader. She's pushing, you know, she pushes everybody out to get an opportunity and to be a part of something bigger. But that's what a good leader does. Um, she cultivates the research talent uh, that's here. Well, the research center, uh, what it does, it, it actually does research on snake venoms. And so the mission of the center is to provide venom, venom products, research, research training uh, for the purpose of, di of therapeutic discoveries. At the National Natural Toxins Research Center, we have a serpentarium, and our serpentarium houses over 450 venomous snakes. And there's about uh, 21 species, 32 subspecies uh, of snakes. They're mainly uh, North American, but we do have uh, some cobras, we do have some, uh, some vipers uh, from Africa, uh, we have uh, some snakes from South America as well. So the venom research ha has been going on for over 40 years. And within those 40 years, we've had five snake bites, which is a really good record. Uh, there's always a risk, especially for the individuals that are handling the snakes. It's not really dangerous to work in the lab, uh, handling the venom or you know isolating the toxins. The danger part comes uh, when they're actually handling the snakes to obtain the venom. And so basically it's a, a two-person job 
uh, they'll be the person that will actually open the cage and then take the grabbers and uh, take the snake with the grabbers. And they'll be the person who will be actually doing uh, the handling of the snake and make it abide into a sterile cup that uh, has parafilm over it. And, and the snake will bite and, and it'll extract the venom into the cup. Uh, I think the most venom that I've seen uh, from a snake was from uh, Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. And it actually gave us three mLs of venom. Uh, and that's, you know, a lot of venom for, for a snake. And it's a lot of venom uh, to be envenomated with. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, like I said, the bigger the snake, the, the more venom, and obviously the, most, the more dangerous it can be if somebody gets uh, bitten by one. Snake bites, if you think about it, can be, exp they're, they're not really bad or good if you look at the bigger picture. It's almost like the same toxins that actually cause this medical emergencies can actually be used as therapeutics, right? It's actually the valuable biological source untapped in a lot of ways to explore, you know, the intersectionality of where these toxins, where they can be applied to. So it's, it, it's even more vast and more fascinating in that regard. It's still a black box, um, in, my, in, in my opinion. And NIH is putting more and more money into it. Well, our program is, is really important because it's trying to discover uh, new drugs from these natural products. And so uh, we know, you know that these venoms, uh, and particularly snake venoms, uh, have components in there that could be uh, life-saving drugs. And so it's extremely important for us to be able to uh, identify some of these uh, molecules that are found in these venoms that actually mimic, uh, you know, the inhibition of uh, blood clots or break blood clots. Or uh, sometimes, you know, they inhibit blood clots and that could be used, you know, as diagnostic tools as well. People have been studying snake venom for a long time, whether it was just an antivenom anti um, development, which is about 100 years old, but with uh, new sequencing technology, with new methodologies exploring or being applied to snake venom has really opened up, I would call the next generation of snake venom research, where you're developing new types of antivenom, where you're exploring the toxins more in-depthly to see their functions and new discoveries are being made. And that's you know, our main purpose, to discover new drugs from uh, these natural products such as venom. So they can be used uh, for strokes, for heart attacks, uh, for cancer, uh, even pain. And also to be able to uh, discover and help discover uh, therapeutics for snake bites. I believe it's five million people are envenomated every year, uh, just to kind of hone the statistics to you, every five minutes, someone dies from a snake bite. So the medical emergency alone um, is, uh, is worth the research. You can see coming from a small town, you gotta take opportunities that come your way and just be able to recognize those. There's obviously times that things are gonna get hard, things are gonna be tough, uh, there will be roadblocks, but if you're just true to yourself and be persistent and uh, keep your eye on the ball, things will happen. Taking uh, the biology classes with, with uh, Mrs. Mucchetti uh, really set me up to uh, have a passion for science and then you know, enter into you know, the, the science uh, area. And, and now I'm the director of the National Natural Toxins Research Center. And I owe it to this place and to you know, the teachers that, that educated us here. I'm here with Dr. Elda Sanchez, who is from Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and she is the director of the National Natural Toxins Research Center there at the university. It's an amazing place. Most people would not want to go in there. I don't really have a hankering to go in there for the third time, uh, but uh, it, it's just incredible. How does your center stack up with uh, other centers like it around the world? 
Well, so we're uh, the only federally funded uh, Viper Resource Center uh, in the U.S., and so we get our monies from the National Institutes of Health uh, through the Office of Research Infrastructure Programs. And so we basically have uh, the largest diversity of venomous snakes in, in, at the university, along with the research component of it as well. One of your collaborators won a Nobel Prize. Uh, tell us about the research that y'all contributed uh, with, with that prize winner. So the mission of our, of our center is to be able to provide venom, venom products, uh, uh, tissues to other researchers all over the world. And so we have been collaborating with Dr. David Julius, uh, who just won the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine, uh, for the discovery of, of uh, channels that uh, elicit pain and heat. And so we've been working with him, uh, you know, providing him the tissues, the venoms, venom glands, uh, where he basically also made a discovery of how rattlesnakes detect infrared signals through the pit sensing organs. And also, you know, isolating uh, specific toxins that target uh, other specific channels that uh, elicit pain as well. How hard is it to get, so, so you're down in uh, Falfurious quail hunting, you get bit by a rattlesnake, how hard is it to get antivenom in a, in a hospital in South Texas, for instance? It would take about uh, maybe 30 minutes to go to the nearest hospital, which is uh, Spawn Claybert. As long as you get antivenom within the hour, you'd probably be okay. One of the things I've noticed in speaking of quail hunting is that when a dog gets bit in the head, he swells up, he looks horrible, but he survives. If he gets bit behind the shoulders somewhere, they tend to die. What, why is that? Do you know? Well, basically, in the head area, there's not, there's not too, too much vascularization, and so uh, there's a lot of bone in that area. So they generally get bit, and, and they can survive from that. But, you know, in, in other areas where there's tissue, uh, what happens is that generally these toxins that are in, you know, the muscle tissue, uh, they tend to degrade that area and cause, you know, problems that will probably end up, you know, uh, the dog end up dying from it. You have students that work there. I've noticed when I go in, uh, is it hard to recruit students or what kind of student are, or is interested in this? What, what major are we talking about? We work with uh, bio, biomedical majors. We work with chemistry majors. And so those are basically the students that, that come into our laboratories. And some of them transition from undergraduates to become our master students as well. But we've also have uh, students or that uh, have reached out to us from other states that want to be part of the venom research because they're interested in the biomedical applications of what, you know, the toxins that are isolated from these venoms do. And we've also started uh, recruiting master students from other countries as well. Good. Well, your center is a is a jewel for the state of Texas, and congratulations on what it what it has evolved into uh, over the decades. And thank you very much for being here with us. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. We're Texas A&M International University. We achieve. We explore. We innovate. We lead. We give, and then we give some more. We're Texas A&M International University. We're Dust Devils, and we go beyond. Just about every week, elementary and high school students visit the planetarium on the campus of Texas A&M University Commerce. For many, it's an eye-opening experience. For some, it's life-changing. So today we'll meet a recently minted PhD who discovered her future there, as well as a dedicated educator who runs the show. We start losing our kids with the awe and wonder. The planetarium gives us the opportunity to invite that awe and wonder in. But the way we teach, we need more hands-on. We need more of that awesomeness. We need them to want to explore. So I have really amazing tools that I get at my disposal to work with and to reach these students. It's a lot of fun. I wanted to come and work with students and I wanted to change the way that we teach. 
We all know that from the way that we learn is how we will emulate that in our classes. So if we're doing something that's fun and hands-on, then hopefully they will take that and do more hands-on with their kiddos. They enjoy it, the kids enjoy it, they learn more and they retain more. And then they will have an amazing, awesome teacher that they will remember as well. We become part of not just a planetarium show, but part of a change in their life, exposure to something new and different. Sarah has had opportunity to grow, and she's had a lot of people in her life that have helped open those doors. But she had to be the one to open the door for herself. She had to be willing to invest in the time and the effort. The kudos all go to her. She's put in a lot of hard work. She's a success story. She is a success, period. She's an amazing person. She has a story to share, and she knows where these students are and where they've come from. She's been where they are headed. So we want to share something that's relatable with our students. Coming to Texas A&M Commerce changed my life. I attribute the fact that I have a PhD, the fact that I can raise my son in a different manner than uh, I was raised or some of my family members. Um, I attribute it to, to the people here. I attribute it to working at the planetarium. This department changed my life a hundred percent. I didn't know anything about astronomy. I never looked up at the stars and thought, wow, that's amazing. That's, you know, um, it never occurred to me to be a scientist. I, I think I may have played with a chemistry set at one point, but I didn't like it. I didn't like biology. I, I don't even think I took a physics class in high school. I, through the planetarium itself, developed a love of the stars. I can tell you stories about the stars all day long. I can take you on a tour. I can take you on a journey of the stars. The stars just never caught my attention. And now I have astronomy tattoos. <laughs> NM Commerce is in a location in the northeast corner of the state. We're in a very high rural area, which means that there are a lot of kids that have never gotten out of their hometown. And driving an hour into Commerce, we get to explore and share what we have here on campus. And so we become part of exposure to something new and different. The planetarium is an amazing tool. It allows us to reach students without having to be invasive. We can bring them in and once they see the awe and wonder that we can present, it usually opens doors. I have had kids that have come through the university, have come through up here taking a class, and they, I came up here when I was in the fifth grade, and we saw a planetarium show, and I think I remember you. It's an amazing opportunity. We use our facility for classes as well. So we took advantage of COVID and of being closed and put in new seats, but we also got to upgrade our system, and we are now running a Digistar 7, which is more bells and whistles, fancy equipment, um, but it allows us to share more and do more with our audience, with people that are coming to see us. We also have an observatory, which is located outside of town, and we open that up to the public for open houses. We try to do that quarterly. There's no charge for those, and it allows people of all ages to come look through the telescopes and enjoy the awe that they can see of the night sky. When you're a first-generation student, um, navigating college is surprisingly hard because you don't have anybody who can tell you what you should be taking advantage of or what you should be doing or, or how to succeed in a college environment, which is dramatically different from anything you've been exposed to in your entire life. I was homeschooled as a very like high-achieving, up-and-coming kind of student that did not seem to matter. I fell into my second semester at TCU. I was a journalism major and then a philosophy major, and then um, I just didn't know what I was doing, had fun, uh, but really wasn't going anywhere. I had a kid at this point and just let life take over. It's like, that's, that's the direction that I'm headed. That's not what I wanna be. That's not enough for me. That's not enough for my son, right? And so I decided kind of right then and there, I'm going back to school. I don't know how to go up from here without doing that. When I came to Texas A&M Commerce, I knew nothing about astronomy. So I definitely came into the school blind. I've visited a lot of places and talked with other students and I've seen other departments. But Texas A&M Commerce became my home and the planetarium in particular. It was like, this is my room in my home. 
honestly, probably one of the best decisions of my life. I met Dr. Davis. She was the assistant planetarium director. She was probably my first friend among the faculty. I'm the single mom, right? So I had a lot going on. I have a child. Um, she's probably one of the first people that I, I confided some of the struggles of being a mom to. And she asked me if I wanted to work for the planetarium. So I was like, yeah. We became really close after that. She's very kind, she's very caring, but at the same time, those high expectations meant that every time she heard of a scholarship coming up or a conference or knew I had a deadline, she'd, she'd be on me to say, hey, um, you need to do this, or you need to attempt this, or you need to accomplish this. The quality of work that I saw in Sarah and the personality, she's just an amazing person. So I offered her a job, and she came to work for me, and she stayed with us, uh, working with the planetarium until she graduated. She's just a vibrant personality, and she was really dedicated to her studies. It's being behind the scenes and taking ownership and taking pride in, in making sure that everything works smoothly, but then and also communicating astronomy to people and, and helping them learn new things and watching them be amazed. People are always amazed when they, they learn new things about astronomy because they, they don't realize quite what's out there. When you look at stars, that's a long time ago. That light took this long to travel here. So I absolutely believe that Dr. Davis helped me learn how to believe in myself. Yeah, coming here definitely skyrocketed my self-esteem. Really, as a professor, if I'm not willing to invest myself in my students, I'm not gonna see that growth. But by developing that friendship and that relationship, hopefully it benefits me and them. I know I've grown quite a bit. <laughs> okay, you. <Yeah. laughs> so this is not just a job. No. <laughs> I did what I did because I wanted to change my son's life. No matter how bad things got, no matter how impossible I thought they were, no matter how much better I thought everybody else was than me, I still wanted to change my son's life. I still wanted to change my life. She wanted to seek out the opportunity and try to make better of her life. And in the end, I think I won. I'm here with Dr. Cherie Davis, who's the planetarium director at Texas A&M University Commerce. Uh, so tell us about the planetarium and how many kids come to the planetarium at Texas A&M uh, University Commerce every year, for instance? Normally, uh, we have between 10 and 15,000 visitors a year to the planetarium, wow. and about 70, 75% of that are school groups. So right. we're the only planetarium in the upper corner of the state, and so we service a great, a great large area. We have a lot of schools that come in from even Oklahoma, and as far over as from the Richardson area all the way into Commerce. Oh. We service about 100 districts a year. So what do you think those kids remember about it the most? What do they talk about when they're there? It's the stars, it's the awe and the wonder. It's the things that they get to see. And in some cases, this is the only opportunity these kids get out of their own hometowns. So getting them on a college campus, letting them take a tour of the campus, letting them come into the planetarium and see something fun. And for them, it's entertaining. For us, it's educational. And so we want them to come and we want them to come often so we can expose them. And tell me about the effect it has on science teachers. I mean, you use it to train sometimes science teachers too, right? I do. I teach science education courses. And in my integrated science class that we study the physics, I do a unit on astronomy. And so I try to take advantage of having the facility and teach that in the planetarium. So how long have you been the director of the planetarium? Uh, about four or five years, but I've been at the planetarium since we opened in 05. And that planetarium has been there for how long, you figure? We moved in with the new building, and it opened for classes in 2006. 2006, something like that. So after all these years, what do you love best about the planetarium? It's a lot of fun. It's really cool, and I have amazing toys to work with every day. So I get to go in, I get to play, I get to enjoy the little people when they come in for school groups. I'm still teaching, so I get to work with the college students. Uh, we also have the observatory, so we get to do some research. It's just, I like the variety and I like the people. I get to work with a lot of different people. Do university students come over there as well, or is it mostly elementary and high school students? Both. We also use the facility for teaching classes. So right now I've developed a new course um, for our signature series, and I'm teaching a class that was designed and developed only for the planetarium called Star Lore. 
We talk about the mythology behind the constellations right. and how that affects the cultures at different locations. So do the kids talk to find the constellations in the sky and things like that? Sure they are. Yeah. So tell me about the effect on students as you watch them come through. What, what, uh, what kind of effect does it have on them? What kind of questions do they ask and what, what do they seem to be most interested in? Well, it's amazing because we have students that can remember making field trips from elementary school into the planetarium. It's, oh, I came here when I was a kid, or we came and saw this, this planet with this big shark that was going around. <laughs> and they can remember making a trip, and then when they come up for classes, it's, oh, what classes can I take? Can we take these in the planetarium? <laughs> um, we also hire student workers, and the student workers usually come in and work with us because they have an interest in astronomy. Uh, some of them may be making the astronomy minor, some of them may not. Um, in the case with Sarah, she did work with us for a while, and she stayed with us through her bachelor's degree. And she enjoyed learning about the stars, but she enjoyed getting to navigate the night sky. So she got to learn how to use the system and to use that to further study the astronomy. Well, thank you very much, thank Cherie. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here, and thank you for what you do. Thank you. The unique spirit and traditions that make Texas A&M University a place like no other are deeply rooted in the core of cadets. Established in 1876, along with the university, the core is the most visible part of Texas A&M's rich history. These are their stories. Reveille, an American rough coat collie is Texas A&M's official mascot since 1960, her care has been entrusted to Company E2 within the Corps of Cadets. Mascot Company is the group's unofficial designation. The Mascot Corporal, Reveille's handler and caretaker, is chosen from within this unit each spring, and Reveille lives with this cadet for the year. The Mascot Corporal escorts Reveille to all of her functions and Aggie engagements. On game days, he leads the fighting Texas Aggie football team onto Kyle Field. The keepers of the spirit have many traditions and experiences that have shaped the Texas A&M legacy for over 145 years. This is the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M University. Breaking Away, how the Texas A&M system changed the game, chronicles a decade of system milestones and the people who achieved them. Available from major book retailers and the Texas A&M University Press.